On June 8, 1958, a brand new 729-foot ore carrier was officially launched in Detroit. She was to be christened the SS Edmund Fitzgerald, named after the chairman of the board of directors of the insurance company who owned her. Mr. Fitzgerald himself was presented at the ceremony, and his wife Elizabeth did the honors. I christen you, the Edmund Fitzgerald, God bless you, she announced and swung a champagne bottle against the ship's bow. Nothing happened. She tried again, and still the bottle remained intact. On her third try, she succeeded, and the signal was given to launch. It took over a half hour to get the steel blocks to release the ship, and finally the huge freighter slid down the greased timbers into the Detroit River. She hit the water sideways, pitched and rolled violently from the awkward landing, and slammed into the dock, sending a giant wave over the startled spectators. One man, 58-year-old Jennings Fraser of Toledo, suffered a heart attack and died hours later. It was a most insuspicious start, and not even a non-superstitious person might be forgiven for wondering if it was all some kind of bad sign. The final voyage of the Edwin Fitzgerald began November 9, 1975, at the Bullington Northern Railroad Dock No. 1, Superior, Wisconsin. Captain Ernest M. McSorley had loaded her with 26,116 long tons of taconite pellets, which were made of processed iron ore, heated and rolled into marbled-sized balls. Departing Superior around 2.30 p.m., she was soon joined by the Arthur M. Anderson, which had departed to Harpers, Minnesota, under Captain Bernie Cooper. The two ships were in radio contact. The Fitzgerald being the faster took the lead, with the distance between the vessels ranging from 10 to 15 miles. Aware of a building November storm entering the Great Lakes from the Great Plains, Captain McTorley and Captain Cooper agreed to take the northerly course around Lake Superior, where they would be protected by highlands on the Canadian shore. This took them between Ice Royale and the Quinoa Pen Peninsula. They would later make a turn to the southeast to eventually reach the shelter of Whitefish Point. Weather conditions continued to deteriorate. Gale warnings had been issued at 7 p.m. on November 9th, upgraded to a storm warning early in the morning of November 10th. While conditions were bad, with winds gusting to 15 knots and seas 12 to 16 feet, both captains had often piloted their vessels in similar conditions. In the early afternoon of November 10th, the Fitzgerald Pat had just passed Michipo Michipolitan Island and was approaching Caribou Island. The Anderson was just approaching the Michipolitan, about three miles off the West End Light. Captain Cooper maintained that he watched the Evan Fitzgerald pass far too close to Six Fathoms Shoal, to the north of Caribou Island. He could clearly see the ship and the beacon on Caribou on his radar set and could measure the distance between them. He and his officers watched the Fitzgerald pass right over the dangerous area of shallow water. By this time, snow and rising spray had obscured the Fitzgerald from sight, a visible 17 miles ahead on radar. At 3.30 p.m. the afternoon, Captain McSorley radioed Captain Cooper and said, Anderson, this is the Fitzgerald. I have a fence rail down, two vents lost their damage, and a list. I'm checking down. Will you stay by me till I get to Whitefish? McSorley was checking down the speed to allow the Anderson to close the distance for safety. 
Captain Cooper asked McSorley if he had his pumps going, and McSorley said, Yes, both of them. As the afternoon wore on, radio communications with the Fitzgerald concerned navigational information, but no extraordinary alarming reports were offered by Captain McSorley. At about 5.20 p.m., the crest of a wave smashed the Anderson starboard lifeboat, making it unusable. Cooper reported winds from northwest by west, 305, at a steady 58 knots, with gusts to 70 knots, with seas of 18 to 25 feet. According to Captain Cooper, about 6.55 p.m., he and, and the men in the Anderson's pilot house felt a bump felt the ship lurch, and then turned to see a monstrous wave engulfing their entire vessel from astern. The wave worked its way along the deck, crashing into the back of the pilot house, diving the bow of the Anderson down into the sea. Then the Anderson just raised up and shook herself off of all that water, far off, just like a big dog. Another wave, just like the first one, or bigger, hit us again. I watched those two waves head down the lake towards the Fitzgerald. I think those were the two that sent him under. Morgan Clark, first mate of the Anderson, kept watching the Fitzgerald on the radar, set to calculate her distance from s some other vessels near Whitefish Point. He kept losing sight of the Fitzgerald on the radar from sea return, meaning that seas were so high they interfered with their radar reflection. First mate Clark spoke to the Fitzgerald one last time, about 7.10 p.m. Fitzgerald, this is the Ander Anderson. Have you checked down? Yes, we have. Fitzgerald, we're about 10 miles behind you and gaining about one and a half miles per hour. Fitzgerald, there's a target 19 miles ahead of us, so the target would be nine miles ahead of you. Well, ca answered Captain McSorley. Am I going to clear? Yes, he is going to pass to the west of you. Well, fine. By the way, Fitzgerald, how are you making out, w out with your problems? Asked Clark. We're holding our own. Okay, fine. I'll be talking to you later. Clark signed off. The radar signal, or PIP, of the Fitzgerald kept getting obscured by the sea return. At about 7.15 p.m., the pipe was lost again, but this time did not reappear. Clark called the Fitzgerald again at about 7.22 p.m. There is no answer. Captain Cooper contacted the other ships in the area by radio asking if anyone had seen or heard from the Fitzgerald. The weather had cleared dramatically. His written report states, At this time, I became very concerned about the Fitzgerald. Couldn't see his lights when we should have. I then called the William Clay 4 to ask him if my phone was putting out a good signal, and also if perhaps the Fitzgerald had rounded the point and was in shelter. After a negative report, I called the Sioux Coast Guard while, because I was sure something had happened to the Fitzgerald. The Coast Guard were at this time trying to locate a 16-foot boat that was overdue. With melting apprehension, Captain Cooper called the Coast Guard once again, about 8 p.m., and firmly expressed his concern for the welfare of the Fitzgerald. The Coast Guard then initiated its surf's search for the missing ship. By that time, the Anderson had reached the safety of Whitefish Bay to the relief of all aboard. But the Coast Guard called Captain Cooper back at 9 p.m. Anderson, this is Group Sue. What is your present position? We are down here about two miles off Parasane Island right now. The wind is northwest 40 to 45 miles here in the bay. Is it calming down at all, you think? In the bay it is, but I heard a couple of salties talking up there and they wish they hadn't gone out. Do you think there is any possibility you could uh, come about and go back there and do any searching? Ah, uh, I don't know. Uh, that sea out there is tremendously large. Uh, if you want me to, I can, but I'm not going to be making any time. I'll be lucky to make two or three miles an hour going back that, out that way. Well, you'll have to make a decision as to whether you'll be hazardizing. Well, you have to make a decision as to whether you'll be hazardizing your vessel or not. But you're probably one of the only vessels right now that can get to the scene. We're going to try to contact those saltwater vessels and see if they can possibly come about and possibly come back. Also, things look pretty bad right now. It looks like she may have split apart at the seams, like the morale did a few years back. 
Well, that's what I've been thinking. But we were talking to him about seven, and he said that everything was going fine. He said that he was going along like an old shoe, no problems at all. Well, again, do you think you could come about and go back and have a look in the area? Well, I'll go back and take a look, but I'm afraid I'm going to take a hell of a beating out there. I'll turn around and give her a whirl, but I don't know. I'll give it a try. That'd be good. Do you realize what the conditions are out there? No reply from the Coast Guard. Captain Cooper tries again. Do you realize what con- what the conditions are out there? Affirmative. From what your reports are, I can appreciate the conditions. Again, though, I have to leave the decision up to you as to whether it be hazardizing your vessel or not. If you think you can safely go uh, back up to the area, I request you that you do so. But I have to leave the decision up, up to you. I'll give it a try, but that's all I can do. The Anderson turned out to be the primary vessel in the search, taking the lead. With the ship pounding and rocking badly, the crew of the Anderson discovered the Fitzgerald's two lifeboats and other debris, but no sign of survivors. The only other vessel, the William Clay Ford, was able to leave the safety of Whitefish Bay to join in the search at the time. The Coast Guard launched a fixed wing HU-16 aircraft at 10 p.m. and dispatched two cutters, the Nagatok and the Woodrush. The Nagatok arrived at 12.45 p.m. on November 11th, and the Woodrush arrived on November 14th, having journeyed all the way from Duluth, Minnesota. The Coast Guard conducted an excessive and thorough search. On November 14th, a U.S. Navy plane equipped with a magnetic um, anomaly detector located a strong contact 17 miles north-northwest of Whitefish Point. During the following three days, the Coast Guard cutter Woodrush, using a side-scan sonar, located two large pieces of wreckage in the same area. Another sonar survey was conducted November 22nd to November 25th. The following May 1976, Woodrush was again on the scene to conduct a third side-scan sonar survey. Contacts were strong enough to bring the, in the U.S. Navy's CRUV, the third controlled underwater recovery vehicle operating from the Woodrush. The CURV third unit took 43,000 feet of videotape and 900 photographs of the wreck. On May 20th, 1976, the words Evan Fitzgerald were clearly seen in the stern, upside down, 535 feet below the surface of the lake. On April 5, 1977, the U.S. Coast Guard released its official report of the subjects, SS Eben Fitzgerald, official number 277437, sinking in Lake Superior on November 10, 1975, with loss of life. While the Coast Guard said the cause of the sinking cannot be conclusively determined, it maintained that the most probable cause of the sinking of the SS Eben Fitzgerald was the loss of buoyancy and stability resulting from massive flooding of the cargo hold. The flooding of the cargo hold took place through the ineffective hatch closures as boarding seas rolled across the spar, spar deck. However, the Lakes Carrier Association vigorously disagreed with the Coast Guard's suggestion that the lack of attention of property closing the hatch covers by the crew was responsible for the exa- disaster. They issued a letter to the National Transportation Safety Board in September 1977. The Lake Carriers Association was inclined to accept that the Fitzgerald passed over the Six Fathom Shoal area, as reported by Captain Cooker. Later, in a videotape conversation with GLSHS, Captain Cooker said that he always believed McSorley knew something serious was happening to the Fitzgerald as the ship passed over Caribou Shoal. Cooper believes that from that point on, McSorley knew he was sinking. Conflicting theories about the cause of the tragedy remain active today. But what caused the ship to take on water, enough to lose buoyancy and dive to the bottom so quickly without a single cry for help, cannot be determined. 29 men were lost when the Fitzgerald went down. There is absolutely no conclusive evidence to determine the cause of the sinking. The bell of the ship is not on display in the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum as a memorial, as a memorial to her lost crew. 
It's been 47 years since the sinking, and their memory will never be forgotten. Does anyone know where the love of God goes when the waves turn the minutes to hours? The searchers all say they'd have made Whitefish Bay if they put 15 more miles behind her. They might have split up or they might have capsized. They may have broke deep and took water. All that remains is the faces and the names of the wives and the sons and the daughters. Lake Huron Rose Superior sings in the rooms of her ice water mansion. Oh, Michigan steams like a young man's dreams The islands and bays are for sportsmen And farther below Lake Ontario Takes in what Lake Erie can send her The iron boats go as the mariners all know With the gales of November remembered Gives up her dead when the gales of November come early. 